Hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, this is my first time that I have like a morning time slot when everybody's still awake. It's really cool. I'm very excited. Uh, my name is Adam Shandor. I'm a, a Slovakian-Hungarian, so I'm from the neighborhood. But uh, nowadays I live in Amsterdam and uh, work as a consultant engineer uh, for container solutions. We're a company helping others adopt Cloud Native. There is my Twitter handle if you would like to follow me, if you find this interesting. I sometimes tweet some things about uh, these topics like GitOps and uh, Kubernetes and operators and stuff. So, uh, first of all, what is a uh, consultant engineer? It's kind of like uh, the warrior priest with one hand fixing a Kubernetes cluster and preaching the gospel of uh, Cloud Native with the other. So, if uh, anybody would be interested in that career, we have opened an office in, uh, in Warsaw and we have an amazing team here now and uh, building it up. And actually, I uh, have a, a bit of a special connection with Warsaw. My uh, godfather was a diplomat here and he, uh, I was here for a while with my wife visiting him. He took us around the city, showed the history and I was amazed that like, the whole old town is just rebuilt from, from scratch. And I also dig in a bit into the uh, the history, and I was uh, was very moved by by the whole story of the Warsaw Uprising. I read this book about it, and it just blew my mind about how uh, Polish people organized the resistance during the whole war, and that led to the uprising and the whole uh, tragic uh, end of it. So yeah, I'm very happy to uh, to be in uh, in Warsaw again. But back to the, uh, the topic of Kubernetes operators and why do I think they are the next frontier in application automation. By next frontier, I don't try to say that this is like the next hot shit that will replace everything we ever had before. By next frontier, I mean Kubernetes operators are where a lot of the innovation is happening right now, right? We have like Ansible for years, we have Terraform, all these configuration management tools. It's kind of settled there and, and Kubernetes operators are the area where, where things are moving right now and it's very uh, cool to, to keep an eye out on, uh, on what's happening there. So, to jump in, let's start explaining the whole concept first. Who here works regularly with Kubernetes? Please raise hands. Okay, so plenty of people who don't, that's cool. I'll explain the really important part you got to understand about Kubernetes for uh, today's talk. And it's the reconciliation loop. Basically internally, Kubernetes works like this. You have a YAML file definition of your application. It's all YAML files these days, right? We are all YAML engineers now. <laughs> this YAML file explains to Kubernetes that I would like to deploy my application. I want to create a deployment object. I would like it to consist of three replicas and I specify some boilerplate stuff and most importantly I say what Docker image I would like to run. What, what Docker image contains the actual code of my application. So once I throw this YAML file at Kubernetes, Kubernetes' job is to create three pods, which those who don't know Kubernetes, pods equals containers for the sake of this talk. We don't have to uh, differentiate between that. So these are three Docker containers. And because here it says that the image should be Nginx 179, these will be three times Nginx 179 containers running on some virtual machines that are managed by the Kubernetes cluster. Now, but the really cool stuff is that Kubernetes doesn't just do this as an action like, okay, create this deployment now. But what it actually does is inside Kubernetes there is a component called the deployment controller and this is a constant loop that's running which job is to reconcile reality on this side with your specification on this side. So whenever, so when you create this deployment object in Kubernetes, this controller will not react by, oh, 
I have to create pods now because the deployment is created. No, it will check that this deployment requires three pods. How many pods do I have at the moment? I have zero pods, so I have to create three pods now. This doesn't sound like a big deal, right? But in practice, this leads to some big benefits in, uh, in application management because whenever one of these three pods dies, the deployment controller will again just reconcile that state with the specification. One pod died, now I just have two pods apparently, I should create a new one to reconcile reality to the specification. Even if I would create a fourth pod, it would delete that fourth pod because the specification says I need three pods. And this leads to a very user-friendly workflow where I don't need to care about what's the current state of my cluster, I can just sub keep submitting these YAML files and let Kubernetes deal with the shit of how to actually go from one state to the other. So if I resubmit this deployment and say replicas is four, Kubernetes will reconcile that and create a new pod here. But if I say the image is something else now, I upgraded the version or changed it to something completely different, then this controller is smart. It will know that to get from this state where I have three Nginx containers running to a state where I, have some, I, need, I want some completely different container, that's not going to be so easy. So it will start actually a rolling upgrade where it starts shutting down the Nginx containers and starting up the new containers that I have specified for it. All in the meanwhile, it can keep at least one container running, it can roll back, so it will initiate this whole complex process that is included in the deployment controller. So this is, the, this is the, the really interesting takeaway from how Kubernetes works, and I think it's one of the key factors in its success is, that, is this reconciliation loop and the fact that all kinds of fancy logic can be, uh, can be encapsulated in these controllers. Another interesting use case is when the controller is actually not creating something on Kubernetes, but outside of Kubernetes. When you run a Kubernetes cluster on Google Cloud and the Google Container Engine is taking care of provisioning the cluster, it will create a GCP ingress controller. So when you create an ingress object on Kubernetes, the ingress tells Kubernetes how to route traffic from outside of the cluster into your pods. But actually to implement ingress, there are different ways to do it. And how Google Cloud does it with their own Google Cloud ingress controller is that it will spin up a load balancer inside Google Cloud. Of course, your Kubernetes cluster also runs inside Google Cloud, but this load balancer service is the load balancer service you have access to from the Google Cloud user interface. So you're practically, you could create this load balancer with Terraform, or you could go to the user interface and click this together, but, or you can, create this by creating an object inside your Kubernetes cluster. So you're now driving your cloud from the inside of the Kubernetes cluster. This is a very interesting concept and a very weird and feels like it's actually architecturally wrong because my Kubernetes cluster rise, runs inside Google Cloud. Why would I control the environment of the cluster from inside the cluster? But I'll show you how this concept actually works out pretty well. Just realized I need to also take care of the time. Okay. So, once we have grasped kind of this concept, um, what are these Kubernetes operators that I'm talking about? Basically, the, I'll go back rather on this one. So, the, a Kubernetes operator is, is this part. It's a process that, con, that contains this controller logic in here. And Kubernetes actually allows us to do whatever in this exact pattern how we work with Kubernetes. The first component is that on the left side, we can create any kind of object that we define inside the Kubernetes API. I can invent a web server object or a database object that and that's just data. I just shove it into the Kubernetes API, which actually saves it into at CD. So there is nothing really magical about this thing. It's just you just put some new kind of object into Kubernetes. Kubernetes will not do anything with that object because it has no idea. It just allows you to save it and like schema checks it. But 
then you can write this part here and actually do something with those objects. And you can write it in the exact same way how the Kubernetes internal controllers are written. You can write this reconciliation loop. You can, you can provision objects outside or inside the Kubernetes cluster, because basically inside here is just normal code that is, that is running. I will go into more details on that. But basically this uh, idea to follow the pattern of the Kubernetes internal controllers to write our own provisioning logic is the idea behind like Kubernetes custom operators. And there are two important use cases for Kubernetes operators. First of all, managing third party applications. For example, you can use Helm or just some YAML files to deploy Postgres or Kafka. Kafka is my favorite example. You can deploy Kafka to your Kubernetes cluster with, with just a Helm chart, for example. But if you use the Kafka operator instead, so it's like a competition to, to Helm, uh, if you use the Kafka operator to provision Kafka on your cluster, you will get special custom resources that you can use. For example, resources like a topic. So you can create topics by putting data by using kubectl create topic in, uh, in your cluster. So you can put your Kafka topics into YAML files and provision them through the Kubernetes API server. Or it can, the, the Postgres operator will create, yeah, so there is uh, a whole list of these, uh, a whole page with all kinds of operators uh, called operatorhub.io and uh, the, the Postgres operator, for example, will attempt to even back up your cluster. So it's really, that's where the name operator comes from. So all the things that we still do manually or pay for, for a, to Amazon to do it for us, uh, these operators can do it because they can contain all kinds of complex logic. Um, I still think that, let's say, running a database is a better idea to use a managed service if you can pay for it rather than, uh, than run Postgres on your own cluster. but this is a very interesting uh, area of, uh, of, of research, and I don't know how many people actually use this in production. For, to run a database on your cluster, I think you have to have a specific use case and, uh, and scale. But for example, the Kafka is, uh, is pretty cool, and I've seen that used, and it's, uh, it works very well. Um, so the second, let me just jump back here, the second use case, and that's what I'll be focusing on today, is Focus not on making super fancy operators that can back up your database and do all possible database operations automatically and completely replace the human element in managing a database, but rather just aim to manage the whole world from inside Kubernetes. So this might sound like a bad idea, and I will bit narrow that scope down in a bit. But the idea is that whatever we want to provision, we create a custom resource for it, we create a matching controller for it, and we provision it from there instead of using Terraform or Ansible or other tools. Um, so yeah, that's the uh, Kubernetes all the things idea. And why is this uh, a good idea in, uh, in certain cases? It's definitely not a good idea in all cases. So here is an example where I want to provision some Aurora DB databases in AWS. Before I go into explaining the, uh, the why, I will go a bit into the, into the how it would actually work in a bit more detail with the, uh, with the operators. Until now, the operator was just one big block, one box with, uh, with the two arrows. Now let's dig a bit deeper into into how does this actually work. So, how I, if I want to create Aurora DBs with an operator, first of all, I will need a custom resource definition that will somehow define my Aurora DB. Maybe it's just a name, maybe I specify some other parameters for it, whatever an Aurora DB uh, needs. And then I can, once I submit this custom resource definition to Kubernetes, this is like the schema of my new custom resource. There'll be a demo, by the way, so don't worry if you don't 
see yet how this would really work in, uh, in practice. Then you can create the actual custom resources, those YAML style objects that you can put into the, uh, into the Kubernetes API server. And for something to actually happen with these resources, you will need this, this operator. It will be running as a pod on Kubernetes. So important fact, operators are sometimes described as like plugins to Kubernetes to extend Kubernetes. But the only place when you're really extending Kubernetes is this. This is where you're formally extending Kubernetes with a new custom resource. But the operator itself is a completely vanilla process running on Kubernetes. It has nothing, Kubernetes doesn't know that there is an operator running on it. It doesn't care. So what your operator actually does, you will need a Kubernetes client library. So you will be writing this in Go, Python, Java, whatever that has a good Kubernetes client library. And we'll watch for any events of this type, any events of uh, the Aurora DB custom resource either getting created, deleted, etc. So very important thing for this all to work, the Kubernetes API is completely event-based. Any modification to any resource inside Kubernetes will be generating events that you can listen to. The, so this watch part will, uh, will be getting the events. Then we need to process those events and have to have some kind of framework. Don't really have to because it's all just the REST API, but it's very nice to have a framework in place. And the only major framework that exists now, as far as I know, is in, uh, is in Go. So there is the Go uh, operator SDK that lets you, helps you handle the event. So you can just pl plug in your own code as event handling code and not really have to deal with uh, deduplicating the Kubernetes events and all kinds of like boilerplate stuff that you have to do. Um, me and my colleagues are working on right now for a similar SDK but for Java to enable writing operators in, uh, in Java and uh, my sample code will be uh, written using that. Um, then the next layer is the actual controller logic. This is where my own logic about what should happen when I see an Aurora DB custom resource. What should happen? Well, what should happen is I'm probably holding in memory at this moment already some credentials to the AWS API, and what should happen is I call the AWS API to create the Aurora DB uh, the, the database, right? So I just call AWS with whatever AWS client library I'm using, and then I will create the, uh, the database. And in this case, you probably don't want the full, maybe you don't really want the full reconciliation loop, maybe you do. So like whether it's a question whether you will be actually watching these Aura DBs if one disappears, what if somebody would manually delete it, what would you do in that case? I don't have time to go into these, uh, these fine points of the, uh, the operator, but generally this is what's happening. Events are coming from Kubernetes, you're processing them and managing the real world, which in this case is the AWS Aurora service. And now comes the why would you want to do this? Who has heard about uh, this, the pattern of GitOps here? Yeah, quite a few people. Um, so uh, explained very simply, GitOps is the idea to store all your uh, environment configuration in Git. Because of the fact that Kubernetes uses declarative configuration, which means we don't have to care what's the current state on our cluster when we are making changes to our cluster. That means we can just shove all our YAML files into a Git repo. Let's say in this case I have two services and they need a few Kubernetes objects to work. They need a deployment, a service object, an ingress, and then a backend service. And I can just put all my YAML files into Git and tell developers that from now on you will be managing your environment only through this Git repo. And that means every change to the environment will be audited, the environment is backed up, we have a history, we can roll back, and all that good stuff. So it's, a, it's getting popularity nowadays, the GitOps pattern, and I think it's a very good reason, it's, it's a very nice, uh, nice pattern. So what happens when you change a YAML file in this database? 
there will be a Jenkins pipeline or some process kicking off that will actually run kubectl apply on all the YAML files, and then objects inside Kubernetes will be created. But now, what if uh, I want to also give these, now, now these developers are fully working through this, this Git repo, right? They're putting YAML files, modifying YAML files every time they do something. It's, uh, it's happening on the cluster. Their environment is getting updated. Everybody's happy. But what if they need some kind of new resource that Kubernetes doesn't have, like an Aurora DB? How do I give them the ability to provision that Aurora DB using a YAML file in their Git repo? And why would I do that? I would do that because this gives a unified workflow for development teams. It gives them a clear interface also. They know what objects they can create, the ones that my operations team is supporting through special custom resources. So I don't have to give them access to like the, the AWS API. I also don't have to react to emails. Oh, sorry, uh, we need a new test environment. Can you create a new database for us, please? We promise we don't need any more. All these amazing workflows. Uh, that still uh, happen in, the, in companies and slow everything down. I think the best way to give developers, of course, there are different ways to do this, but the best way, I think, if developers primarily work with Kubernetes is to give them extensions to Kubernetes for their objects. And this also limits our scope of what we want to provision with operators, right? We don't want to be provisioning everything through operators. We just want to provision those things that we want to give as services to, uh, to development teams especially once there are many development teams in a large company, this kind of fully automated workflow is, is amazing and does, uh, does a lot of uh, good. So I can allow developers to put an Aurora DB YAML file here. Um, that will, after the kubectl apply happens, that will create a new resource inside my Kubernetes namespace to actually something to happen with that resource. I will need the operator, as I explained uh, in the previous slide. And then this operator can create the actual Aurora DB. Right, so this is, this is in my eyes, a very, very nice workflow how to give developers uh, access to all kinds of resources that are not out of the box supported on Kubernetes. Same goes for the Kafka topics, right? If you run the Kafka operator on this cluster, a developer can just create new Kafka topics by putting YAML files into their uh, ops repo. All right, let's see the, the demo that I have heavily updated yesterday. Um, no, demo time, yes. Cool, I'll try to move the laptop here. It should make it slightly more uh, convenient. I have like 10 minutes for this. All right, let's, uh, let's do it. So let's clear this, it doesn't look so scary. I don't know if I cleared the, uh, the oh shit, I think I didn't uh, clear the cluster. No problem, let's do it now. So what I will be doing, I'll be doing the Aurora uh, use case, but with MySQL, because I didn't want to do anything uh, with the internet during a demo. Okay, once this is done, we are ready to go. There is my trusted IntelliJ IDE, because I'm a Java developer originally. And I will be showing you some code. How does this all work? First of all, here is, is this big enough like this? People in the back, should I uh, zoom in a bit more? Yes, okay. Um, I can try this uh, fancy presentation mode. Yeah, it's, it's pretty big now. <laughs> so you can see this is a Kubernetes object of type custom resource definition. The name is schemas.mysql.sample Java operator SDK. That's, this is the interesting part. Um, this is the, the, the 
cool part. So you know, in, uh, when you're those people who have used uh, kubectl, you can like type kubectl get pod or kubectl get pods. You can like do the plural, and this is where you define that. So there's like the singular schema. This operator will be managing MySQL schemas because that's what they call databases in MySQL. And the kind that I will be using in my YAML files will be MySQL schema. So, and I also have like a little open API v3 uh, schema validation there for, uh, for my objects. So that's all good. This will define an object like this. Kind is MySQL schema, name is my database, and I can also specify an encoding because I wanted to add something there to, uh, to show that you can like have a spec like with normal Kubernetes objects and, and add some things in there. So this is, how, this is my MySQL schema object. So first of all, um, here, let's create the custom resource. So now if I would do kubectl, uh, k is just kubectl, aliased, okay, so I don't have to type so much. Sorry? Uh, right, okay, I will maybe move to the right, move back here. And I'd rather make the, the window uh, smaller. This? Okay, let's, uh, let's do it like this. So if I now say Kubernetes get schema, it says I don't know what the hell you're talking about. Now I will apply the CRD YAML file. Oh, not here, but here. Now this custom resource definition has been created, and now I can do TL get schema, and I get no resources found. So suddenly, even my client knows that knows that it's uh, that that schema type thing exists. So next, uh, we must have the actual controller running for something to happen with these uh, schemas. By the way, I also have MySQL Workbench here, and if I Refresh this, you can see there is the database is completely empty. So let's, uh, this one be close for now. Let's start up the operator. So the operator will be defined by this deployment.yaml file. So you can see that it will define a namespace where it will run and it will be a normal Kubernetes deployment. So the operator is nothing special. It's a normal Kubernetes deployment with this image because it's all local on my computer that we see now. I'm using uh, Docker for desktop to run Kubernetes. It's happening on my desktop. I don't really need to specify like a proper uh, image registry here. I'm specifying my MySQL host username and password because MySQL is running on the same cluster. So it's uh, just mysql.mysql. And yeah, there's some readiness probes, liveness probes. It runs as a normal process. So what I do is uh, I apply this deployment YAML to my cluster. It has created my namespace, my deployment, the service account, and cluster role binding. These are necessary because this pod will actually be talking to the Kubernetes API. So I have to give it a security context that where it actually can do that. So operators in that sense are a bit special. They need a lot of access to your cluster because it will probably be creating objects or watching objects in many namespaces and so on. Okay. Now that my operator is running, I can try creating a database. So I will just uh, use this example YAML that I have here. Oh, and let's watch the logs of the, uh, of the operator to see what's going on. Yes, follow. Okay, so we see that uh, the operator has indeed started up. And now I will do the database. CRD slash example YAML has been created. You can see schema mydb created. If I go to MySQL Workbench and voila, a database has been created. It's amazing. I wrote Java code that creates a database. It's uh, <laughs> 
we we made it all the way here after uh, now 50 years of IT or more. <laughs> so let me just show you a little bit the code that's at work here. Um, just mainly to show you how very simple it is. Also, it's a bit. I will bit bit go back because it's a bit go smaller. It really doesn't fit. So basically. Using this operator SDK that uh, we are creating for Java, in the end, the client code is just this. It's just an event handling code where I get an event called create or update resource. I get my schema object as a Java class, described as a Java class. So it's a schema, it has a spec, it has a status, and the spec has the encoding in it, right? Exactly what we have seen in the YAML file. Um, Yes, you, where is my toolbar? Uh, okay, never mind. So back to the schema, Ugh. controller. So what, when I get a create or update resource event, all I do is get the database connection, connect to the database. Uh, I need to check whether the schema already exists because I might get the same create event multiple times. So here you can see that writing operators is not as easy. Sometimes you have to do some legwork because nobody's holding your hand here, right? The, the operator SDK knows how to manage the Kubernetes events for you, but it has no idea what you're doing with MySQL or whatever else you're, you're provisioning there. So there is no help at all. You're just writing general programming language code here. So I do a select. If the result set doesn't have the database schema in it, then I go and create schema with the right encoding that I had in the spec of the schema and with the name that I had in the metadata of the schema, right? We had that in the, uh, in the ex ugh, example YAML file, name in the metadata, encoding in the spec. And then I actually update the status of this custom resource, so we can see that too. So now, I, as the user who just created a custom resource and don't care about what the operator is doing in the background, I just got a database, then I can like get schema, output the full YAML, and you can see that here is my schema object, a lot of other stuff that Kubernetes adds, but it also has the uh, the status created and like a JDBC URL to my database so I can maybe grab it from here. And finally, before I run out of time, we, I, I will show you this, this GitOps workflow. So here I am in the, uh, in the GitOps, in the ops repo, I just created a directory. I don't actually have set up the, the whole like uh, Jenkins pipeline and whatever attached to a Git repo. But let's say this is my ops repo and I want to deploy my application, right? And so I have a deployment, I have a service defined, whatever else I want. But now I can actually add my database YAML there. So if I check, uh, again, I have like pretty much the same thing as, I don't know what is this here, weird, but doesn't matter. Um, I know it. I know it works, so it's fine. <laughs> Not gonna be fixing that right now. Um, okay, so I have this uh, this uh, database YAML here, and now the deployment process that would run in a Jenkins normally would do kubectl apply f everything in this uh, in this directory. Oh, dot. And it goes, and yeah, it fails a bit because the namespace at the moment has not been created when it's trying to create a database, but I just rerun it, and now it works. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Should have put a little sleep in there, but... Uh. Okay, so now this has created a new namespace called user repo, get pods, pods and databases and schema in the user repo uh, uh, namespace. So you can see my pod is running and it has a database. And actually this user DB, we can see it here. It's been created 
And it, the application itself has actually created a user, a table inside it named user. And I can, I think somehow we can edit it and like insert uh, something. Yeah, like one, first name A, B, C. Uh, save this somehow. I haven't used MySQL for so long before this. Oh, I think there is an like apply button down here, yes. Yes, and now if I find the port where this application is running, actually, then I can just just go and look at it. Yes, amazing. I'm a web developer now. <laughs> All right, so demo didn't fail. That's great. <laughs> and I think I'm mostly out of time. I think I will, um, I will skip this one and rather, uh, this is a, oh, you know what, if just a few words about this. This is something that we, we were, at my latest client where I was working, it's a German company for, called Fiducia GAD. We were creating a, pretty complex enterprise scale CI CD system. And that's where we decided to use operators to provision that system for every single team. And basically what teams do is they, uh, they put a object called a team inside the Kubernetes API where they describe their team and what environments they need. And then we have an operator that's hooked up to these team objects. And it actually breaks it down because a team is consisting of many, many objects. So we went for this kind of microservice architecture where this team operator doesn't actually create the real world things that the team needs, but actually creates more custom resources for that team, like Jenkins, deployment pipelines, Bitbucket repositories. And then there is an operator for every type of object here. And these operators will actually create the real world Jenkinses and deployment pipelines and so on. And why we did this with operators was also because we kind of failed with Terraform because these were all things that Terraform didn't support. Um, and it was just easier to write the provisioning code in Java. But also this way, everything is now in the Kubernetes API. So operations people can go and query all the Jenkinses or all the deployment pipelines just using kubectl because it all lives in the, in the Kubernetes API. So, yes, thank you very much. If, if anybody would be interested in uh, helping us uh, build, bring operators to the world of Java and uh, improve this uh, operator SDK that we are building, you're very welcome. For anybody who wants a smooth uh, entry into the world of operators and uh, don't care about Java too much, then just go for the Go SDK. Like this also works and the examples work, so you can play around with it. It's, uh, it's pretty good already, but, but the Go SDK is like the full-fledged code generation and everything is just called operator SDK, the Go one. I forgot to put the link. Okay, any questions? Yes? So what is the advantage of using custom operators versus third party operators? Um, I wouldn't say there is any. Like, uh, for example, in this case, all we are provisioning, there is no third party operator. So that's why we, are, we wrote our own. Um, so if, you, if there is a third party operator, like for example, for Kafka, just grab it and use it. There is, uh, just go for it, it's not a, Okay, so the question is why would you not use Helm to, uh, to create? Yes, okay, so, so why, was, why was it good? Yes, for example, in this case, the Jenkins could be deployed by Helm. It's a good point. So 
with Aurora DB, you can't deploy Aurora DB with or MySQL, MySQL database clearly with Helm, right? So there it's it's clear, right? Why would we need a new YAML file? Um, why would not we not deploy the Jenkins with Helm? Uh, because we wanted to add some more management functionality. Helm just creates stuff, and that's pretty much it. It can like maybe upgrade it and delete it, but uh, but that's it. Um, also. What you achieve with these operators is that you have a level of abstraction. Helm doesn't really abstract things away, it's just does templating. While here, I can just create an object called Jenkins, which has barely any parameters, because all the logic is in my operator. My operator defines how, in my company, I want Jenkins is to be provisioned. And it's very, very flexible, because it's custom code. It also means it's more work to do than a Helm chart. But it also means that you have way more extension points, way more options. You can monitor the Jenkins like during runtime, right? You can back it up. You can do whatever you want with it uh, down the line. But I wouldn't say use operators for everything, right? Helm is perfectly valid thing. Yeah, yeah absolutely. That's a, yes. Uh, no. It's uh, not really because uh, actually the Go uh, operator SDK has some kind of high availability thing where it's uh, like who's like it's tracking who is the leader of the operator instances. I'm not sure what kind of extreme use case they had where they had to use that. I'm pretty sure we in this case had absolutely didn't need it because whatever an operator does, it doesn't. It usually doesn't matter if it does it in one millisecond or or one second. And if it would die, it gets restarted by Kubernetes. So uh, you would lose just a little bit of time, and it will. And it's event-based, so it will just receive all the events anyway. So you don't really need the uh, need high availability for the operator itself. Yes. Okay, so yeah, so the question is, let's go back to answer this one to back to here. So the question is, if you already have some existing code base that provisions stuff, let's say with Terraform or Bash or whatever, would it make sense to put that into an operator? Um, if we look at this picture, my answer would be yes, because of the fact that the unified interface to everything for the development teams. So if you can, I think uh, I think it's uh, it it can be useful to do that. Depends also on your scale. If you're managing like two development teams, probably not. If you have 100, then uh, then probably yes, because then the the value of this one unified interface towards all the resources uh, is getting bigger and bigger. And you can can put all kinds of code into in, and make it an operator basically because. Uh, because it's in the end just a process talking to the Kubernetes API. If you're using Bash, you would be actually implementing the operator logic using uh, kubectl in, in, your, in your Bash script. So it's, uh, it's, it's doable. I don't know how would you react to the actual events, but maybe you can do it. But Or you can wrap it in some process and then use it from there. You can run Terraform from the operator. Actually, I think there is a framework for running Terraform from operator. Except the problem is that Terraform a lot of time accepts, uh, expects user input, and I don't know how would that uh, that really work, but theoretically doable. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. Yep, thank you. And uh, yeah.